Good evening and welcome to tonight's program, the fifth and final in our series celebrating 75 years at Argonne National Laboratory. Tonight's topic is nanotechnology. My name is Dawn Lepret and I am the Assistant Director of Development and Programming with the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. Tonight's program is brought to you in partnership with Argonne National Lab. 1946 was a memorable year. A gallon of gas cost 15 cents, while the average cost of a brand new car was around $1,150. The United Nations first meeting was held in London, England, where members adopted the first resolution to deal with these new issues facing the globe, atomic energy and nuclear weapons. And Argonne National Lab was founded with the mission of harnessing nuclear reactions for peaceful energy purposes. Argonne National Laboratory is a U.S. Department of Energy multidisciplinary science and engineering research center where talented researchers work together to answer the biggest questions facing humanity. Now, the Chicago Council on Science and Technology's mission is to inspire and engage all segments of society about science and technology and their contribution to society. We are delighted to be entering our 15th year of offering 30 or so programs each year, such as tonight's program on STEM, topic, STEM topics to the public. You can visit c2st.org to learn more about upcoming programs and to donate. You can also visit c2st.cnf.io to ask questions and participate in polls. We'd like to introduce tonight's speakers, Dr. David Shapluski. His research interests include the design, fabrication, and testing of micromechanical and nanomechanical devices, developing novel methods to realize nanoscale devices for use as sensors and actuators, studying the nonlinear dynamics of M. NEMS resonators and oscillators, including synchronization and modal coupling, studying plasmonic behavior and light scattering, ranging from Raleigh to me for the formation of metamaterials, including applications such as flat lenses, and creation of quantum systems of quantum dots coupled with mechanical vibration to carbon nanotubes. This is some juicy science. So remember to go to c2st.cnf.io to ask any questions and participate in the polls. And before we get started, we'd like to ask Jessica Burgess, the Education Outreach Lead at Argonne Lab, to say a few words. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining tonight. Um, I just want to throw one more thing out there that we've been doing as part of the 75th anniversary at Argonne this year is a uh, what we call Argonne Voices. They're audio stories of people who work at Argonne, um, and they're really short, two or three minutes, and there's some very interesting topics on there, not just about stuff that we do at Argonne, but how some people got to their careers. Um, so check those out um, at anl.gov slash 75th anniversary slash Argon Voices. And with that, I am going to pass it off to Dave. Hello, everybody, and thank you for the kind introductions. And uh, I guess I should have maybe uh, limited the uh, background bio a little bit. <laughs> maybe not all the uh, complicated words. Um, I'd also like to remind people that tonight is also brought to you by the letter B and sponsored by the number eight. So if we could go to the slides. All right, so again, this is uh, Argonne's uh, 75th um, anniversary. And so tonight I will be uh, giving a talk, uh, well, giving an interactive uh, colloquium type um, talk about uh, things towards nanotechnology. And so again, I'm Dave Sapluski and the scientist at the Center for Nanoscale Materials here at Argonne National Lab. And so I do really encourage everybody to sign up for the online polls. Um, it's a great way to get some feedback on the audience and also to have you participate in uh, what's going on tonight, or at least get um, your perspective on some of the things or um, just uh, engage a little bit more in this. 
So I will give you a few minutes um, because uh, the next few slides are going to be just about my background information. So if you do go to sign up for the polls or the chat, you won't be missing uh, anything really necessarily about nanotechnology. Um, and so, um, so go ahead and do that. And so if we could go to the next slide. So just as a personal background, um, I grew up in uh, the southwest suburbs in uh, St. Linus Parish. And so if you've been down in that area, a lot of the um, places uh, go by the parish you're at, St. Linus, St. Christina, St. Cajetan, St. Mike's. And so even if, even if you weren't in those schools, people kind of knew where you were from by those areas. And so I still like to use some of that, especially on that, in that area. So, and as a personal, I played baseball into high school um, and also in high school, I worked part time at a lumber yard down the street, uh, which taught me a lot of interesting things about um, that I ended up using later on in research, um, mechanical uh, things and measurements and um, just how things work in general. Um, after high school, I went on to the uh, UIC where I received a uh, bachelor's in science in physics. Um, and after graduating there, I went uh, on to receive a master's and PhD in applied physics from uh, Cornell University out in New York. Um, after that, I did a postdoc and then um, was hired on as a staff member at Sandia National Labs down in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and then after that, I came up here to work at Argonne and I've been here for about uh, 11 years. And so currently I live out in uh, Naperville I'm currently a parishioner out at St. Joan of Arc Parish in Lyle, um, where my kids have gone to school um, there and they're now uh, into high school and college. Um, I enjoy sports, fishing, hunting, gardening, outdoor stuff. Um, I do enough, also do some running. I wouldn't say that I necessarily enjoy that, but it's one of those uh, things to do to get your four um, sessions of 30 minutes of uh, exercise is suggested by uh, to stay healthy and when I grow up I want to be well a nanoscientist but I guess I am kind of grown up and ironically when I was growing up this really wasn't necessarily a thing and so uh, early on I was really looking more at astronomy and then I got a part-time job at um, at UIC as an undergrad working in the clean room. And ever since then, I really love just making things on that scale. And so back then there was only micro technology. Now we've advanced to nanotechnology. All right, so we'll go to our first poll question here. Um, and it is, uh, was anyone able to watch any of the videos posted on the event webpage? Um, and so these include the nano song out at Berkeley um, and then Last year for Nanotechnology Day, which is October uh, 9th, I was able to do a presentation on um, some of the work that we do here and just some ways of creating nanotechnology at Argonne. And so um, you could see some insight into the clean room and some other things. And I will say this, it's good to see that at least one person saw those because I'm not sure that I had enough time to create sock puppets and a song and dance um, for this. So if you haven't viewed those, I would suggest going back to the uh, C2ST webpage, looking them up and at least viewing the nano song. It is entertaining um, and it's only about three minutes. Uh, obviously it's not very technical, um, but it's worth taking a quick look at. And then obviously the other video uh, provides a little bit more background information um, for tonight's talk as well. And so just so that we're all kind of on the same page, um, so, um, we'll start off with a brief discussion about dimensions and scales. And so people um, are maybe somewhat familiar with yards from a football field. Um, and so using imperial uh, units, there's three feet in a yard. There's 12 inches in a foot, 36 inches in a yard. And so it's really hard to kind of, in the imperial units, to go between different length scales. Um, and then obviously we go into fractions of an inch and things like that. Um, the metric system's quite a bit easier in that regard. And so a yard and a meter are roughly the same, um, or they're close enough that people could 
use them somewhat interchangeably um, for you know practical purposes. Um, and then the great thing about the metric system is, is that there's things like 100 centimeters in a meter, 10 millimeters in a centimeter, so there's 1,000 millimeters in a meter. So it's very easy to switch between units of measurement in the metric system. Um, and so just some a few other things that people might be familiar with, obviously there's 25.4 millimeters in an inch, and then things that, you know, to go smaller than an inch, you know, you can go to fractions of an inch, but there are units like thousands of an inch, also known as a mill, which should not be confused with a millimeter. Um, and so this is like, if you have ever done any machining work, or if you buy like a plastic at the local hardware store, if you're gonna do some painting, sometimes they're sold in like 0.9 mil up to two mil. Um, aluminum foil is on the order of a mil or two. Um, so those are some comparable units and that's uh, those are equivalent to 25.4 micrometers. And so if we go to the next slide, just as a you know brief summary here, if the green square in the middle is a millimeter and you have 10 of those, then you have a centimeter. And so that's how it's easy to go through um, those units. And so the metric system on a, or any scale system on a linear scale is really hard to represent. And so um, what I've done here is use a computer-aided design um, software to generate some lengths that are accurate with respect to each other. And so you can see on the top 10 centimeters, we go down to one centimeter, one millimeter, and then we get down into the micrometer and eventually into the nanometer range where we'll be talking about nanotechnology. But the difficult thing on a linear scale is that if you look at the one millimeter, that still extends off the screen to the right. Um, a tenth of that is 100 micrometers. And so you can see that accurately represented. Even 10 micrometers is a tenth of that bar, obviously, and that's represented. But the one micrometer is probably not super accurate. And then everything below that the software um, uses um, just something to say, hey, there's something here, but that's not an accurate representation. And so we really don't want to look at these things on a linear scale. So if we look at them on a logarithmic scale, if we start at the middle and start at zero and move over to one, one unit would be, let's say, one meter. And then we go to two meters or three meters. But on a logarithmic scale, those are powers of 10 instead. And so zero is, 10 to the zero, which is one meter. And that's the length scale that we do things, you and I. So I'm a little bit less than two meters tall. Um, you know, your desk is maybe a meter and a half or two meters, things like that are kind of commonplace. And then you go up the scale to 10 meters. So this is maybe the height of your house. 100 meters is maybe the width or, you know, a, a common dimension of a bigger building. Um, and then you get up to a kilometer. And this is kind of where you know, distance to a nearby school or something like they're done measured in kilometers, tens of kilometers is kind of distance to that, you know, between cities, or hundreds of kilometers between cities. And then we get to the ever common megameter. Um, I'm not exactly sure why in the metric system we don't use megameter, um, but typically people do refer to it as thousands of kilometers. Um, but this is more like country size. And then, you know, you go 10 to seven. By the time you get up to 10 to the eight, meters this is the distance it would take to get to from the surface of the earth to the surface of the moon and so this 10 to the 0 to 10 to the 8 is kind of the powers that we're going to think about in a minute and then obviously then you, know, you can keep going 10 to the 9 10 to the, and so mega and giga are um, units uh, or are, uh, prefixes that you would more likely associate with bytes so for computer memory or hertz, megahertz, you'll see that on your um, radio in your car. Um, gigahertz is a little bit more uh, where you'd find in like um, your Wi-Fi or your cell phone communication. Um, so there are those are used. I'm not sure why they're not used for meters, but that's okay. So if we go back to 10 to the zero at meters, and now we start going smaller, we have a tenth of a meter, which is 10 centimeters, and then one centimeter is one hundredth of a meter. A millimeter is a thousandth of a meter. But now as we keep going smaller, people are you know, maybe somewhat familiar with those, but a lot of people are probably not familiar with more with micrometers. And so it's a million micrometers to equal one meter. So if you took one meter, you know, kind of the width of, uh, you know, if you held your arms out a little bit, 
uh, and divided it equally a million times, that would be one micrometer. And then in order to go all the way down into the nano regime, we have to go 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight to get to 10 nanometers. So the distance from the surface of the earth to the moon is zero for, to 10 to the eight. To go from zero to 10 to the negative eight only gets you to 10 nanometers. And so this is kind of the um, analogy that you kind of need to think about, that if you were tall enough where your head bumped into the surface of the moon, a nano, 10 nanometers would be kind of the height of an average person. And so one nanometer would be a pretty, you know, uh, a smaller object, maybe, um, you know, something like the height of a cup or something like that. And so that's really the length scales that we're talking about. It, it's really drastic. And so if we go to the next slide, just a brief summary again, 10 to the zero meters is one meter, 10 to the minus three meters is a millimeter, 10 to the minus six meters is a micrometer, 10 to the minus nine is a nanometer. And so to just to put this into perspective, if we ask a simple question of, you know, if you wanted to say, hey, can we see, you know, how much can we see? So if you, um, if you wanted to know what is the smallest gap that someone with good vision can discern without the help of any glasses. So if you took someone maybe in their teens or early 20s, maybe even a little bit earlier than that, and said, you know, if we put two objects next to each other and left a small gap, and made them closer and closer together, um, how small could you make that and still discern that there's something there without it disappearing? And so I'll live, we'll let people uh, answer these questions. Uh, there are some different choices here, 100 micrometers, 50 micrometers, 20 micrometers, 10 micrometers, and five micrometers. Um, and so, We'll let people talk or we'll let people answer some of these here. Um, and so just on those length scales, a hair, a human hair, the average diameter for someone with not gray hair is about 100 micrometers. Um, some of us with grayer hairs, and those are a little bit bigger um, at, you know, a few hundred, 150, 200 micrometers. And so we got some answers in here now um, and those are some pretty good guesses um, we're pulling out a little bit and pretty uh, diverse set either we can see something we can't see anything really small maybe that's the uh, nature of the we're doing a, a profile of our audience here and all of the uh, people over 20 are saying hey i can't see anything that small um, but then we do have a couple people who think that you can see something pretty small five mic micrometers so Five micrometers is on the order of cells. And so you're really not seeing those kind of skin cells or you know, some bacteria at that scale. So, so the correct answer is somewhere around 50 micrometers. And so for the four of you who guessed that, congratulations, kudos to you. Um, and so that just kind of gives you an idea of um, uh, where micro and nano kind of fit in. And so what is, so we'll kind of get to the topic of tonight and sorry for the long introduction, but I really wanted to make sure everybody was on the, kind of on the same page of understanding units and dimensions and where we're at. So the Oxford Dictionary defines nanotechnology as that first definition there, the branch of technology that deals with dimensions and tolerances of less than 100 nanometers, um, especially on the manipulation of individual atoms and molecules. And the, the uh, government has a web uh, site where they are devoted uh, a lot of this and they give you kind of the roughly the same answer and so if we go down to the uh, next slide um, there's also so if you go to that link on the top and uh, you know i'm not expecting you to type it in right now but maybe if you want to review this video if you want to get some more um, concrete examples of nanotechnology you can go to this website um, so you can review the video it will be posted later to youtube um, and so you could go back, you could stop on the slide and you could type it in, or you could just do a search for www.nano.gov. And they give some examples and a reflective coatings on prescription uh, glasses, computer monitors, windows. So if you've been downtown in the summer, it looks like the windows are all highly reflective. That's to reflect the UV light and to, um, to uh, reduce heating costs or cooling costs, sorry, in the summer. 
things like composite films for uh, baseball bats, carbon fiber films for bats, for cars, airplanes, the latest um, airplanes are coming out are carbon fiber because it's really reduced um, weight, uh, coatings for clothing, nanoparticles and paints, lubricants, catalysts. And then of course, uh, one of the things is consumer electronics. All of your electronics now are made with nanotechnology. And so on that note, if we have one last poll question, so go ahead and start answering this one. So when do people think that nanotechnology started? Uh, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, or more than 100 years ago. Um, and so, you know, there's, we could probably split some hairs. We gave you the definition. You kind of know the length scales of what's going on. Um, and then we can kind of take a good guess at kind of what this is, uh, of when this kind of came onto the scene. And hold on one second. Thanks. Um, and so this is um, not a very accurate or defined, you know, it's not like all of a sudden here's nanotechnology or it didn't exist before here, but just to kind of give you an idea. And so we have some people somewhere on the order of 50 years ago, which is when a lot of this technology, when probably related to consumer electronics um, was going on 20 years ago, kind of turn of the century. Um, those are all good guesses. But if we go down now to the next slide, or actually if we pop over to me, um, yeah, we can do now um, where we can, you know, what we, the answer really is, at least in my opinion on this, is when kind of when life started. So all living organisms are constructed via nanotechnology. And fortunately for our sake, it's done so automatically. We don't have to think about growing. We don't have to think about um, producing muscle cells or any of this. But once that, you know, once that egg is fertilized uh, by a sperm and you start a new person, it is all, um, basically constructed all by itself in a, you know, kind of a limiting way, as long as you get enough nourishment and everything, you will continue to grow and, you know, go into a baby and then a young person or into an adult and do an older adult. And so all of this is kind of nanotechnology. The food you eat, the nutrients you get are all on the order of nanometers, typically um, by the time it's digested into your body. And I'm not an expert in uh, biology, um, but to me, this is kind of a, a great, the, kind of the greatest example of nanotechnology. However, I know that that's not really kind of what people were uh, thinking about, and it's not really what we talk about anyways, in, in necessarily. So the more kind of um, uh, canned answer for that is this talk given by Richard Feynman um, in, the, in 1959. So this was a a presentation he gave at the American Physical Society in Pasadena, California, titled, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And if you look up this, you can find this. They have, there's full, complete transcripts of this talk on the web. And basically, he started talking about what happens as we make things really small. And the middle one was kind of interesting. Um, he was going to offer a prize of $1,000, which nowadays, I'm not exactly sure who would be jumping at that. But in 1959, that was quite a bit more money, um, you know, almost the price of a car, as was pointed out earlier. And basically to take pages on a book and print them on an area that you needed to use an electron microscope to read. So this is kind of where it started. Um, about 30, 40 years later, about a little bit before the turn of the century, the government said, hey, this is a great opportunity for both science and saw that the fields were going there. And so they created these nanoscale science research centers, which is from where I'm talking uh, this evening. And so the mission is, uh, they list twofold on their website to enable the external scientific community to carry out high impact nanoscience projects through an open peer reviewed user program. So we have people who come to the CNM, um, they write a proposal, this is the science we wanna do, it goes out for peer review, all the ones that are accepted get assigned, and then we help those scientists um, perform their science. And then we also conduct in-house research to help that along and so that we are also experts in this area. And then by combining and collaborating with the users, we can you know, develop 
um, even more science. And so in, in order to make this practical, the, at the time that they implemented this, they did a really good job um, of you know, creating facilities and uh, equipment and uh, hiring staff to, um, to meet this need. And one of the, the you know, most um, advanced thoughts on there, you know, advanced, you know, being able to anticipate it the most was to operate a nationwide geographically distributed set of facilities. And so we're distributed throughout the country um, and so that people don't have to travel too far in order to be able to do this research. And so that, that was really uh, prescient of them. And so the last kind of big point that I'll emphasize here is that it's available free of charge. So we don't charge our users and provided that they plan to publish their results. And so here, this is kind of um, at Argon. These are the, we get users from all around the world. And we do things, so this page is just a brief summary of some of the things, and I'm not gonna go into these a lot. There's a lot of characterization, x-rays, scanning pro. Um, we even do quantum work, um, SEM, TEM, um, spectroscopy, and all of this is on our website. You can feel free to browse through that. Um, and then in the lower right here, um, let me see if I can make this a pointer. Ooh, no, all right, that's fine. The lower right here, we can do some, um, modeling and theory to help understand everything that's going on. But what I'm gonna spend the next few slides talking about is some of the synthesis of exactly how to make things at the nanoscale. And so one of the ways is through what's called bottom up. And there's two major ways, bottom up and top down is kind of how people group them. And bottom up um, kind of is one of the great examples of the science paper from 1993 where what they did is they took a scanning probe and they pushed around a bunch of iron atoms on the surface of copper into a ring and then they imaged the ring. And so this is really, I mean, so this is nanoscience for sure. I mean, you're pushing atoms around. Now it's not super practical from a large point of view if you have to move one atom at a time using a mechanical probe and then image to make sure that it's where you think it is, but really great feat of science. And I will remind everybody that I am one nanoscientist out of probably tens of thousands of nanoscientists. So I will present a brief introduction, you know, uh, some brief topics uh, from my perspective, but it's not complete and I'm not the only person doing this. And so there's a lot of people out there doing this. And if you included all of the industry, you're probably up into the millions of people working in this area. Another way to do bottom up um, is to do same similar to biology. Obviously, we're not quite at making our own um, organisms and stuff, but um, this group out at NIST has um, developed methods of how to create DNA into very specific patterns. Um, on the right-hand side, um, you can see um, they've incorporated certain molecules that make the DNA bend, and so they can make these flat sheets. They can make them into a, into a cube, you know, the outside of a cube, they can make these triangular pyramids. And here you can see an image of that. And so they're still working on how to do things that, you know, nature does, but we're trying to understand that more and more all the time. Another way uh, to do what's called bottom up is to start with a chemical reaction that starts into a precipitate, or you can even seed it and have uh, go into solution. And then the particles grow thermodynamically limited. And so then, you know, you can get different sizes from a few hundred atoms up to, you know, a million atoms. And because of the different sizes, they have a different electrical properties. So when you, um, when you uh, excite them with UV light and then they decay across a band gap, they'll emit different colors all the way from blue up to red. Another bottom up that kind of bridges between the two bottom up and top down is these uh, self-assembly of polymers. And so what you can do is you can create a polymer, one side hydrophobic, one side hydrophilic. And when you anneal them, you can get them to form these stripes. And you can do this across a very large area because that's thermodynamically um, favorable. And they can do this across a whole 300 millimeter wafer, so 12 inch wafer, in CMOS, so the, the, the processes that make your electronics um, uses this to help them with patterning for elect 
consumer electronics. So not only is it bottom up, but it, they combine it with top down, and this is kind of a bridge between the two. Um, and so as a, and sorry, this is the Paul Neely Group out of the University of Chicago. You can be, visit his webpage for more information there. Um, and so basically bottom up is a you know, way to start with atoms or molecules, and then you provide some thermodynamic reason for them to stick together, and, or you can manipulate them with probes, and then you, you know, use that to create your purpose. The other way is called top down. Sorry, I'm a little bit behind, so I'm gonna speed up just a little bit. Um, basically, it starts with a substrate, and then you can deposit film. So this is how all of your consumer electronics, everything, flash memory, your computer monitor, your, your LED monitors, your processors, all of your communications are made this way. You start with substrate, you can deposit films, you use a photosensitive polymer on top, you expose it to light, and then develop away the part that was exposed. So for some of our um, more senior people who are watching, this is similar to the, how um, film and photo photographs used to work. Um, cameras weren't always digital. Um, and then once you've created a pattern in this polymer, you can transfer that into the underlying film, rinse off the polymer, deposit a different film, and repeat the process to make structures that are very complex. And so, in a standard electronics process, um, th this you may do this somewhere between 30 and 100 times in order to realize your final uh, electronic configuration. And now it's even advancing more depending on what type of lithography you're actually doing. And so as a brief summary of top down, you start with a substrate and this can be anything. It's typically semiconductor, but it can be metal, dielectric, deposit films, dielectrics, metal, semiconductors, and then use uh, lithography to create unique patterns on the surface um, and then transfer that into the surface, either wet or dry etching. And then of course, rinse and repeat. And so I will go into one specific example before I open it up for question of some of the work that I'm doing here that was mentioned at the beginning of the creation of um, uh, a confinement of uh, carbon nanotubes and coupling that to mechanical motion. So this is the pattern we have at the scale of 100 millimeters. This is four inches. So, you know, about the width of your hand that kind of, you know, not spread out. And then if we zoom in on one of the patterns, that's kind of at the 10 millimeter scale. And you can see there's a lot of features here. If we zoom in even further, now we're down to kind of half millimeter. Then we go to zoom in even more and then we're down to 20 micrometers. And now if we zoom in even more, we can see that each one of these bars, oops, sorry, each, each one of these bars is uh, 50 nanometers. And so we're gonna make this into a metal pattern so that we can control the electrical response of a carbon nanotube across a gap. And so you can see as we go back up, we started out at a macro scale, four inches, 100 millimeters, and then we go all the way down to the nano scale, but we have to keep zooming in so that we can see what we're doing. And we do this through electron beam lithography, which takes electrons emitted, focuses them through a couple of lenses, and then actually writes. The patterns are so small that, you know, visible light is kind of on the order of hundreds of nanometers. And so we have to use something much smaller. So electrons are that much smaller so that we can make these patterns on the uh, nanometer type scale. And so as a brief, what we do is we start with the substrate. We use, again, a polymer that's is sensitive to electrons. We do a pattern, and in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna deposit a metal, uh, platinum in this case. We lift off the rest on top of the resist. We use a reactive ion etching, so a plasma process to etch away the silicon underneath, and we end up with a structure that looks like this. And so as a brief example, what I'll show you here, these are the electrodes, and so we can apply different voltages on these. Across here, and I hope this really shows up on your screen, shows up a little bit better here, you can see that this white line is a carbon nanotube. And so we were able to, this is collaboration um, with uh, some great people out of, um, uh, out of Spain at ICFO. And um, what we can do is we can create a carbon nanotube suspended across this gate, and, uh, across these two electrodes, and then use voltages here and we can isolate um, 
some of the electrons traveling in here and then couple them to the mechanical vibration, just like a string. You can imagine this is, looks like a string and so it would play like a guitar string. And so we can couple the motion of that string to the, to, um, to the electrical properties of that nanotube inside. And if you wanna learn more about that, you can read this article. It's a bit heavy on theory, but it's very uh, well represented. And so I'll kind of wrap that up here with a summary of kind of nanotechnology. So I you know, gave a brief introduction of myself. We talked about some units and some properties, and then we got into a little bit of the history of kind of nanotechnology. We went into where you can practically do some nanotechnology. And nanotechnology is this branch of technology that deals with dimensions and tolerances of less than 100 nanometers. I'm not exactly sure what you then consider things between 100 nanometers and one micrometer, but that's okay. Um, especially in you know, manipulation of individual atoms and molecules. Um, and so then there's the two major categories that people kind of talk about is these top down and bottom up techniques. And I'd really like to thank the uh, Center for Nanoscale Materials at um, Argonne National Lab funded by the Office of uh, Basic Energy Sciences uh, from the Department of Energy. And then this is the um, acknowledgements from the collaborators out in Spain. So we also thank them greatly for their funding. Now we can open it up for questions. Thank you, it went a little bit longer, um, but I hope that you were uh, learned some stuff today or were exposed to some new information. Absolutely, thank you so very much. And I really appreciate the time spent on looking at the metric system and how that works. Um, there's a question about that, but we have an active queue this evening, Dave. Um, okay. And one of the questions is, what are the products or are there products in the market today that are informed by your research? Um, so, so the semiconductor industry is really, and I actually, if you can put the two of us um, on, the, on there, yeah, great, with the slide. Um, I mean, so the semiconductor industry is really driving a lot of this, A, because it's profitable, but also because of the great need and the potential for this, it has really been helped with a lot of um, both government funding and scientific support. So um, I don't know that any of my individual contributions have been, um, I have, I don't know, six or eight patents. I don't know that they've been put into a personal product, but some of the similar techniques have pretty much you know, been driven to make it so that your cell phone has more computing power than some of the early satellites that, you know, were sent into space in the 70s. I mean, it, it, it far outpaces that. And so, yes, we've, um, you know, come a long way. And it's a lot of this is driven by um, research in these areas, scientists trying out um, new materials, different films, different methods. Um, one of the big pushes now is to go to this uh, EUV, which is a way of making really small patterns. And it's really was driven by, you know, 30 years of research into different materials. How do we even, you know, combine light that that's on that small of a scale? How do we create polymers that are sensitive to that? There's so much that goes into this that, you know, a, a company the companies do some research on their own, um, but it's really driven towards, you know, uh, a lot of uh, improvements of the products that they're doing, whereas um, scientists at national labs and universities are much more open into how does this just work? And so not as many constraints on the areas of interest that we can look into. Um, so. Thank you. I appreciate the answer to that question. We've come a long way from an operator <laughs> connecting us to talk yes. to others to having multiple phones. Um, I'm going to ask another question. Sure. Not, it, it's Of course, it's related to nanotechnology, but I like this because I know I couldn't do it when I was there. Can you major in nanotechnology in college now? I don't know if they're offering so I so ironically so the way that I'll and I don't have you know maybe somebody does but what I will say is that nanotechnology in, uh, encompasses 
all fields. I mean, you'll find scientists here, just here, we only have, you know, 40 scientists that work here, and they come from such a diverse background, chemistry, biology, physics, and then all of the engineering, electrical, material science, um, chemical engineering, all of these uh, areas are able to uh, make significant contributions in this field and provide unique opportunities to combine. And so um, about 20 years ago, um, there were, you know, it was pretty, it was much easier to make strides into nanotechnology. Um, you know, some of the early, even some of my early papers were about um, just, you know, hey, we made something on this scale. As we've progressed further now, it's more about collaborating between different areas to find solutions. Hey, we this is a problem we experience in uh, chemistry, and we can use something that we learned from a different field and combine them to make something new or to, for a new discovery. And so that's um, so that's so. There's really I don't know that there's a, you know a degree called nanotechnology. But if you look in all of these fields, you will find applications and research going on um, for what we would call nanotechnology. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, an interesting question that I'm not holding you to as representing all <laughs> of nanoscientists, but um, it's been popular in the queue. Um, we use the metric system in science classes, but why don't we use it in everyday life? Because <laughs> I'm not president. No, I'm just joking. I, I, I don't. <laughs> I, I, I think there was a push in the late '70s, and the population really pushed back. I, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I, I have heard comments of people that if you could get rid of daylight savings time and convert to the metric system, people would vote for you for president. So if, if that's all it takes, I will run for president on that. <laughs> but I, I don't know. There's no real good reason. The rest of the world, even England has switched off the, the imperial units. And so, you know, it, it it's just a more practical system. The problem is, is that people are used to um, the older system. I, I think that's slowly changing. I wouldn't be surprised in 20 years or 15 years if we kind of made the final switch. A lot of consumer products made overseas or even cars the components are made in the metric system. So now, you know, when I go and work on something, you have your imperial wrenches, you have your metric wrenches, and now you get to figure out, okay, which part, you know, who, who designed this part? And is it, you know, um, and what system did they use? So it, in my opinion, I don't see anything holding back from uh, going completely to the metric system other than, you know, um, sentimental reasons. Mm, and we have a young generation that's quite active. Um, I know um, when I started teaching high school, it was certainly a fight and we sp spent the whole year <laughs> practicing and practicing. Um, but I, I um, appreciate that nanotechnology is in the news more and I'm hoping if anything yeah. else, the appreciation of that scale exists a bit. So thank you for indulging that question. Sure. Um, Here's another uh, question for your expert opinion. What would you say is the best way of determining what field of science you want to go into? Well, that is a good question. Um, I would say initially find things that you like. So if you find that, um, uh, that you like to figure out how things work, um, then engineering, um, is, is a great way to go. If you like to understand why things do that, like if you're constantly asking why, why then more of the, you know, um, less applied sciences. So more like, you know, chemistry, physics, uh, biology are not as uh, necessarily, um, there's more information about fundamentally why things do that. And the engineering kind of takes over more of how do we make it you know, a practical implementation of that. Um, so I would definitely look for things you find interesting, even around the house, you know, um, cooking, baking is a lot of chemistry, um, mechanical things. If you like working on cars, mechanical engineering phys has a lot of physics involved as well. If you like, um, 
if you like playing with gadgets, electrical engineering, if you like to figure out how uh, communication is done, cell phone, your Wi-Fi, if you like to you know, do some of that, then both electrical engineering or computer science. Um, if you like you know, um, to develop your own apps, you could do um, computer programming. I know that there's a hidden so there's so many companies out there that are advertising that they need all levels of science, engineering, and especially things like computer programming, um, that there's so many job openings that I would definitely explore uh, what you like to do. And then also consider um, some of the prerequisites. So um, high schools are not as great at doing this type of anticipation, but colleges typically can provide, hey, if I want a degree in physics, here's kind of some of the math that you're gonna need to take. So you're gonna need to take these math classes, or maybe you don't like um, math for math's sake, then you could do maybe some more applied engineering type things. And so look for, um, you know, find things that you find interesting and entertaining and that you're willing to do in your free time. Because if you're willing to do um, some things like, you know, hey, I like to um, work on cars, then something like mechanical engineering might be really good for you. Because again, you know, there's the quotes that I'm not a huge fan of, of if you love what you're doing, you'll never work a day in your life. But, you know, it, it, has, some, it has some truth to it that if you find it exciting and interesting, then your work won't seem so challenging or mundane you'll be more likely to keep engaged in it to learn new things and you you know you'll find it fulfilling but that's all kind of up to individual people so look for things that you really like to do that's an excellent answer to a really good question um and exploring i um, yeah. have heard countless stories of individuals interested in a particular field of science and maybe attended a talk or did an internship in something else and went, wow, I didn't even know this was an option. So um, right. giving yourself permission to explore. And, and look for opportunities at a lot of universities will hire undergraduates in different areas. So if you're already in college and you're not quite sure, Go to somewhere where you think you might be interested and look to see if they have some jobs. I mean, I, I was I was really fascinated by astronomy and the stars as I was growing up. But then, you know, it, from a practical point of view of, you know, where would you go to study that? And, and now, obviously, it's much easier because I, you know, even this, it's a remote. <laughs> you could remotely log on to a telescope and you could look from anywhere in the world. But back then, it wasn't quite so easy. Um, but I started working in a uh, fabrication facility at UIC, and I just really love the fact that I could make something at such a small scale and then see it and then use it for something that, you know, I was kind of sold on the area. And then as micro kept shrinking down, it kind of led me right into nano. And so, um, you know, look, look, look for opportunities to explore. Like you said, you know, look for an opportunity through, um, you know, an internship or, um, you know, uh, just even just um, a, a job hired on in a lab or something and see if you like it. And if you don't, don't be afraid to then, you know, to switch and look for other opportunities. Obviously, give it a good shot and introductory to any job is usually, you know, pretty mundane at the beginning, but then it tends to get more interesting the more you know or the longer you've been at it. But, you know, explore things. See what see what really interests piques your interest. Thank you, and I think that segues into this question: How do you make the nano tools to accomplish this work? So there is a huge industry, and if we go over, if we show up some, uh, put up the slide here. Th this uh, is just some of the imaging techniques that enabled this, and so if you look back. Um, kind of in the 1940s, they were able to create um, transmission electron microscopes um, and then scanning transition electron. They figured out that, you know, if we shoot electrons through materials, we can do imaging with it. And so this is also so, you know, I, I gave you some, you know, some uh, nice examples of, of the uh, brief summary of the briefest summary of, of some of the technology. But it's driven by a lot of 
um, the ability first to create um, uh, things at a much bigger scale. And so if, if we think about even, so on the bottom here, we'll see that, you know, in the, so, you know, um, electronics, and I, sorry, I go back to this, it's somewhere that I'm personally interested in, and, and I think it gives a good example of some of this. In the 1970s, um, you, you had 10 micrometer technology, and that was cutting edge, and this was great, and this was super fast, it replaced some of the earlier um, MOSFET and BJTs, and then it keeps shrinking. And so all of these industries are working together, the people who make tools, to create the patterns, people who make tools to um, image the patterns, to do the uh, surface characterization, the analysis, all of it kind of gets pushed forward um, by each other by working together and then ending up, you know, as you can see, as you keep progressing, um, you know, we reduce noise in electronics. And then as the electronics get better, it allows us to make even smaller things or even more equipment with even lower noise. And so then we can, you know, make things even smaller. And so, you know, we, we've went, we went from the first transistors in the mid forties were some pieces of uh, materials that these guys at Bell Labs kind of glued together on a bench top and was, you know, centimeters in size. And by this year, we're talking about electronics at a five nanometer node. And now five nanometers isn't, you know, the final thing. It, there's some bias in that, but it's probably more like 30 or 40 nanometers. But nonetheless, we went from centimeters to tens of nanometers over 70 years. And it's all kind of driven in unison through um, research at universities, through just increasing performance in all of these fields. So. That is a very good question. I have a few more, but I know we're running sure. out of time. So I'm going to ask this. What are some of the future applications of your patents or the research that you've done? Where is it going? So I don't know. That's a good question. Um, some of the, so one of the, some of the stuff that, and you even alluded to it at the beginning with, let's say, um, meta materials or meta lenses um, you could we could envision some of that integrating it with potentially quantum systems um, it's really well designed for that and and i think you guys are going to do a, a segment on quantum i was not going to try and cover everything nanotechnology and quantum all in you know 35 minutes um, but you may see some of that um, creep up in, in those areas. So for sure, the last few slides, I mean, if you go up to the slides here, um, you know, this could in theory be either a charge qubit or a um, spin qubit. And so a qubit is a unit of, um, um, to create a quantum computer. So it's a unit of logic in a quantum computer and so potentially this could be used for that. And so, you know, there, there's lots of different applications that are potential. I, you know, again, I'm a little bit more sciencey than engineering. And so we're trying to figure things out. And then at some point we do look for applications. So we always keep that in mind, but we're not necessarily driven as much as, you know, there's a lot of groups at Argonne who have, you know, tens of patents on batteries and things like that, where they're, you know, it's much more, immediate um, realization of those technologies. Okay, I'm going to squeeze this in. Sure. What is the future of nanotechnology? Where is it headed? What do you predict we'll see in the next 20 years? That is a good question. Um, I, it's really started to slow down in terms of, you know, obviously there are now fundamental limits. Um, even at, you know, some of the, uh, uh, if we go back, uh, let's see, if we go back to a couple of the slides we're, we're approaching. I mean, you can move around atoms and sorry, I'm toggling through. I mean, you, you can create structures that are already on the order of single, you know, or tens of nanometers. And there are some thermodynamic pushback on that. Like, you know, will we see single individual atoms maybe but at some point you're kind of fighting some of um, nature and of in itself 
So I'm not sure that I think the biggest area for growth is in um, collaborations between um, different scientists in in areas that aren't, you know, not in just your own area. So let's combine and let's work together and then we'll attack problems from two different angles on, you know, bigger, um, more complex issues as opposed to hey, let's just try and make something small or let's push some atoms around on the surface. Maybe we can now use that to understand biological function of certain uh, molecules or proteins or how things fold or, you know, understand those as opposed to something as simple as, you know, a lot of the last 20 years has been, I can just make it small. And now we're transitioning out of that into, okay, now that it is small, what else can we do or how do we then integrate that? into a into a broader picture oh and that is so exciting it is yeah thank you thank you so much for your time and your expertise this evening um the enthusiasm the patience it's all appreciated yeah. we want to thank our audience for joining us this evening um, we will be talking about what's new at Argon with more STEM programs, including quantum in 2022. And we want to thank Dave again for his expertise and his time sure. sharing the nano world with us. We are hosting a tasty in-person fundraiser in two weeks on the 1st of December called Deliciously Diverse, a food science experience. Um, come chat with Brittany Towers Lewis We'll be at the Mars Brewery in Bridgeport. Um, please join us for science, broods, arcade games. We were talking about Pac-Man at some point today and <laughs> food. So you can go to the C2ST website to learn more. We also invite you to evaluate tonight's session at C2ST cnf.io and tell us what you thought um, and what you'd like to see in the future. Um, if you're interested in supporting C2ST, you can go to c2st.org. Mm -hmm. And we also invite you to sign up for our weekly newsletter and to stay up to date in what's happening with STEM. And thank you for sticking around to the end. We hope you learned something new. And now comes that just really, really important part. If you liked what you've seen, like this video, subscribe to our channel, and you can even hit the bell icon to find out when new videos are uploaded by C2ST. Um, and if you really, really like the videos, please feel free to leave a comment. Again, your time is precious. We thank you for spending it with us. Thank you for watching and stay safe.